I can swallow up, bottle up, I'll put up, feel like Godzilla. Get out the way, Eminem, this is my video! Gojira, also known as Godzilla, is the most popular piece of Japanese media ever created. Let's just pretend anime is not a thing, okay, for like 20 minutes. Godzilla is so popular that a lot of people didn't even know that it originated in Japan, or that it's in the public domain in the United States, since Toho, the company that created Godzilla, never expected the freak lizard to get marvelized one day. So they didn't renew and manipulate the copyright system like a certain company that does with all their beloved IPs. Walt Disney? Breaking news, Mickey Mouse is now public domain. Oh wait, never mind, just Steamboat Willie. Not, not even that. The name is still claimed by Disney, so the only legal way to name it is Boat Rat Drives Boat. But this free copyright for Godzilla is only in America. In Japan, our boy is still in shackles. But even in the United States with freedom, hot dogs, gunslinging, and uh, th that one place. Have you ever been to Ohio, sir? No. Japan still tried to sue the red, white, and blue because, well, you miss the shots you, you don't take, Luka Doncic. I'm not Japanese, and I was born in 2002, the same year Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla came out, alongside Mike's new car. Does this have anything to do with Godzilla? <laughs> no, it doesn't, but I'm keeping it in the video anyway. So yeah, I didn't really know anything about Godzilla for most of my life other than its influence on American culture. I knew more about Reptar and Shelly from Frankenweenie than the real Godzilla. But then in 2014, when I was 12 playing, I don't know, GTA 5? Oh, my N-word, huh? The first Americanized version of Godzilla came out. Yes, the first, because 1998 never happened. Jesus Christ. Fast forward to now, 2024. Japan has released a new Godzilla film starring Eminem's hit album, Kamikaze. Zombie brains make for bad sushi. And in the States, Godzilla is now collaborating with King Kong in what looks to be a brand new Fortnite event, which isn't that much of a stretch since they were in Call of Duty, for some reason. I know 2024 just started, and we haven't had a skipper video in a while since he was rotting away during the holidays. New year, new me, alright? We're back. Don't all clap at once. But let's go back to 2014 to examine the playing field and how we got here. Godzilla is super interesting to me. After the 2014 movie, I grew up and went to school and played video games and doodled in map books that cost a lot of money, but I didn't care because look at this drawing. Mmm, homie. But then at age 16, I was activated like the Winter Soldier to hate the 9 to 5 Matrix. Look mom, being a brain surgeon is cool and whatever, but I want to pursue the arts. AKA the epilogue to what is eventually going to be homelessness or a bullet to my head. So I did a film study course in high school where the teacher was the head football coach that hated his damn life. So instead of teaching anything, he put on crash course videos from YouTube where Lily Gladstone from Killers of the Flower Moon taught me film history. Thank you, Lily, for sending me down a warpath with Letterbox. Eventually, I started learning stuff for myself in film history, okay? I, I was hitting the books. Books being video essays from other idiot film geeks online. Thus, I went down in a really big Godzilla rabbit hole, and it gave me a big appreciation for the creature, its impact on filmmaking, and made me reevaluate how I look at the Godzilla brand as a whole. Also, there's a big thing I need to address in this video. I kind of hate Godzilla, if we're gonna be honest. Get the out, man. To make this really easy for you to understand, Godzilla has what I like to call the Jurassic Park effect. Jurassic Park is a great movie that has cool dinosaurs and sexy Jeff Goldblum, but the film still has heavy messaging. Dodson, Dodson, we've got Dodson here. See, nobody cares. It's a critique on corporations and Walt Disney-like figures that try to play God on the grounds of greed. They also like to suspend my Twitter account for impersonating Harrison Ford, which I didn't do. Totally. Answer me, you black son of a bitch! The raptors and T-Rex are awesome, this is very true, but they aren't just there for the sake of existing. The dinosaurs have a bigger purpose to the overall film, thus making Jurassic Park still iconic to this day. It also kind of revolutionized CGI and changed the landscape of film, yada yada, but Jurassic Park, yeah, the IP is now just CGI wars with Chris Pratt. I don't know what the hell a carbine rifle is gonna do to dinosaurs. I mean, Mark Wahlberg used a, a gun to fight metal aliens. I give up. And while still making a lot of money, because they sure as hell did that, uh, they have like no cultural impact at all. This is what happened with Godzilla. I don't have any nostalgia for the old Godzilla movies, yet I still watched them a bit when I was a kid. The fuck? And even rewatched them recently when I got the idea for this video. So no bias. 98% of them suck ass. Godzilla fell into the same trap that all successful franchises eventually fall into. Godzilla's look was more fascinating to shareholders and executives than the original intentions and creativity that made him even exist in the the first place so they spammed out godzilla films he's fighting bugs oh! 
He's fighting mechanized versions of himself. He's fighting three-headed dragons. He's doing shit like this. Because why the hell not? And some of the films are fun, I'll admit it, but for the most part, a lot of the legacy of Godzilla just reeks of cheaply made cash grabs. So when Godzilla turned into a cartoon for kids, a lot of adults stopped caring. What is this shit? So then the cycle reset, and this time Goji went to America, where the same thing happened again. We got a serious Godzilla, then people complained that it was too serious with not enough Godzilla, so the franchise became Looney Tunes, and the sequel somehow had worse human characters, and then people got annoyed with Millie Bobby Brown, the fat kid from Deadpool, and Alfred from Atlanta spilling water on a computer to fry Mecha Godzilla's motherboard to save the day, and this made some people not really like Godzilla that much anymore. And now Japan has gone back to reset that cycle, and from ground zero, we got a breath of fresh air again. So yeah, Godzilla is in a constant battle of balance between being really serious and being really stupid, but the good is really good, so let's talk about that good. It's 1925. Some dude named Harry O'Hoyt made a stop motion dinosaur movie called The Lost World, not the one with sexy Jeff Goldblum and people getting smoked in tall grass, but rather stop motion clay. Which leads us to 1933, where Harry inspired a guy named Willis O'Brien to make a stop motion movie titled King Kong that had a giant monkey going ape shit. This then inspired a Japanese special effects director named Eiji Tsuburaya, who ended up being the co-creator of Godzilla, which means America was 2001's Jay-Z the blueprint to Japan. Eiji Tsuburaya was making movies until he met this guy named Ishiro Honda, and they both said, yo, what's up? You like movies? I like movies. But then the world started going beast mode, and then BOOM! Imperial Japan started going beast mode, and then ring ring! Yeah, Honda, congratulations, you just been drafted to the Imperial Japanese Army. Pack your stuff, we go at midnight. And during this war, a massive toll was taken on young Honda. Then Honda came home, instantly went back to the grind and started making some movies. World War II was still going beast mode so filmmakers had to stop making movies and instead were cranking out good old fashioned propaganda. In the states, even Walt and Boat Rat Drives Boat were doing this as well. A Japan studio formed for this propaganda named Toho Studios that was showing all the cool tanks and guns. Look, they even put Call of Duty's World at War menu theme on the screen. The mustache man was going crazy in World War II as well, affecting the Lego man that you can learn about in this video after you finish this one. Harrison Ford was still fighting Nazis, but this time on a train with a full CGI face. And uh oh, Japan attacked Hawaii. Not just Hawaii, but Pearl Harbor. Japan was hyped. They threw a little party even, thinking that they just did something crazy. Then Toho Studios made a fake propaganda film about the bombing that looked so real it even convinced the USA that it was real footage. America wasn't having it. Chester, calling the big guns. Ring ring, yeah hello Robert J. Oppenheimer, you're needed immediately. He then smoked his little pipe, put on his little hat, and played a game of telephone with his communist friends. Uh, allegedly. Allegedly. He got tasked to make a big bomb codenamed Operation Manhattan. He then went to Los Alamos, New Mexico to cook. But somehow, the guy who cooks in New Mexico got called Heisenberg instead of Oppenheimer? Heisenberg was a Nazi scientist in Germany, by the way. What the fuck, AMC? And in between adultery and literally being me, he finished the bomb, took it to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and turned that bitch into Fallout 3, with the only sole survivor being Wolverine. Japan took the L and surrendered. Truman kicked up his feet and ate sushi off the stomach like me after editing 30 seconds of this video. And Japan was now under new management. In 1946, Honda came back to Japan to see that Hiroshima was decimated, and then went back to making movies. America had control over Japan, and said no more propaganda, no more emperor, and worst of all, women could now vote. All right, who put that in the script? Was it you? Don't fucking lie to me. 1953, no more strict laws about propaganda. Happy, happy Japan. 1954. America started trolling and <laughs> Fuck does that mean? America started trolling and did a nuclear test on their hydrogen bomb in the Pacific. The bomb was much bigger than the scientists expected, so the radiation caught up to a Japanese boat named the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5, which killed all the crew via radiation. And the fish market was completely fucked. Poor Japan, we know you love ethical fishing. We know you love ethical fishing. Yeah, Japan was pissed, and rightfully so. And this controversy pushed Toho producer Tomoyaki Tanaka to want to make a political film related to nuclear war. Like King Kong, America was once again the blueprint with the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, about a monster attacking New York after nuclear testing. Tanaka wanted to do the same thing, so Godzilla was made. There's a good video by Big Action Bill about the history of 1954 Godzilla in the description, check that out. But the original Godzilla is not like the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Honda didn't want to make the film to get cheers and applause. It wasn't a film that was made to be a good laugh or to be an entertaining blockbuster. Quite the opposite, actually. Gojiro was made with the intention of invoking fear and anxiety while also raising awareness about the looming threat of nuclear war that 
is still present in today's discussion. Hell, one of the most popular films in 2022 was Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, with the exact same intentions and messaging as 1954's Gojira. Even the main scientist character in Gojira was based off of Robert J. Oppenheimer, who was regretful of the atomic bomb's creation, and spent his life blackballing the hydrogen bomb, which the testing of that hydrogen bomb affected Japan and got Gojira made in the first place. Godzilla is used throughout the film in strategic ways, representing chaos to human characters rather than being used as a sole spectacle, which benefits the film since that level of restraint makes Godzilla a spectacle anyway by default. His destruction of Japan is to represent the atomic bomb used on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it's sad and scary, and this is elevated by the human characters that are portrayed to be survivors of a tragedy. The ending of the film even has this Oppenheimer-like character sacrifice himself to kill Godzilla with his own made atomic creation, and the reason he sacrifices himself is for the sake of humanity, making sure that the knowledge to the chaotic power that kills Godzilla dies with him. Even Godzilla's death in the film is not celebrated and cheered. His death is instead seen as a death that never needed to happen. The film instead uses its conclusion to say this, rather than celebrating. <laughs> Gojira was still made on thin ice through the hot tensions with the US, so the US is never blamed for Godzilla's creation in the film, but even without the politics of Japan and the US, Gojira is still objectively a war film that provoked a lot of discussion and thought. For 1954, the film is serious and gritty. The human characters serve a purpose, Godzilla serves a purpose. It pushes so many standards in the special effects world as well. It's a masterpiece in world cinema, and is not talked about enough due to it getting censored by the United States, which we'll talk about later. 1954 Gojira is also why I don't like it when God Godzilla is an action prop. It just feels like Boat Rat drives boat to me, since I see the character more as a man versus nature, rather than fighting toys for children. This is why Godzilla 2014 by Gareth Edwards is the best version of Godzilla in the States. But even then, Godzilla doesn't really work in the United States. 2014 Godzilla is the most grounded of the MonsterVerse films, having the most restraint while using Godzilla on frame in unique ways. It's still one of the best looking Godzilla films due to the directing by Gareth Edwards that relies a ton on perspective shots. The sentiment was even kept not years later in a spin-off show called Monarch that treated 2014 Godzilla the same way, even with it being abandoned in later films to a different visual style. Before even getting the reveal of Godzilla in 2014, you could feel his scale. While being smaller than both his King of the Monsters and Godzilla vs. Kong variations, he feels the most massive in this movie. Even for the antagonist Mutos, perspective shots are still filmed from the human perspective, making the creatures scale massively. It makes the monsters feel like real threats in the human world, and seeing the monsters from the eyes of kids on a bus, marines on a halo jump, or a shot from the evacuation center, makes this obvious fiction feel grounded. 2014 Godzilla is really good on this front, with a lot of homages to the filming of 1954's Gojira, before the direction became really stylized. Since average moviegoers didn't like barely seeing the monsters, with human characters taking most of the screen time, and when they did see the monsters, it was really dark. But even with the more stylish change later, the human characters ended up being worse somehow, giving them more importance than shitty plot lines. But 2014's human problem has a lot to do with how Godzilla Godzilla is structured, and how it being in the US hinders its storytelling. American Godzilla as a whole is an oxymoron thing to begin with. A thing made to represent America's atomic bomb in Japan is now being used for American heroism. So because of this, you can't really get that much depth with Godzilla, since he's the protagonist ally to the American military. The US doesn't have the same history of catastrophe as Japan did with the atomic bomb, and America is also obsessed with patriotism. So instead of making Godzilla an allegory for the consequences of mankind's actions, or have a much larger depth of Godzilla being a force of nature against the United States, he's now instead Superman, where he gets recontextualized to be Superman, which is hilarious when you rewatch 2014's Godzilla with this perspective after watching Japanese Godzilla films. First off, that hydrogen bomb test that destroyed the Lucky Dragon 5, which got the 1954 movie made in the first place, well now the history has changed, and the hydrogen bomb was used to attack Godzilla on that test drop to protect the greater mankind, and it accidentally made him bigger. And after being threatened by this walking nuke and realizing there's nothing the US could do about it, it's now going to be the savior to America against the Japanese threat that was forced out of hiding by humanity that then attacks Hawaii, where then the Japanese threat gets killed by a walking nuke that goes down in a heroic sacrifice, and then he decides he's got one more in him, so he gets up and everyone claps for him as fighter jets fly by, saving the day as he goes back into the water. Take in mind, like, thousands of people have probably died to Godzilla, and by the looks of it, evacuation seems to be terrible. It's funny when watching it, because at first Godzilla isn't even the main focus 
focus of this Godzilla movie. It's this Japanese threat that Walter White is warning everyone about, and then Godzilla only comes on screen to handle business. And when he's attacked by the US military, at first he doesn't even retaliate or go beast mode. This dude is only hyper focused on destroying this Japanese threat and shares the sparkle with the main character where they save each other. It's quite beautiful actually how much Godzilla cares about the whole world. No, he just cares about the US because when he goes to China, China? even that shit gets absolutely decimated in his ego fight with the gorilla. Making Godzilla Superman is strange. And later in the MonsterVerse, they try to add depth to this. Like, look, um, he actually killed a bus full of children. And this company called Monarch is really shady with documentation and control. And the whole world is still full of PTSD, which is cool at first. But then you remember this is the same guy in the same world where he teamed up with a monkey to fight a robot version of him that was made by a three-headed dragon that got defeated because water was spilt on the computer. And then Godzilla and the monkey are teaming up to fight more monkeys. And now there's a baby monkey. And now he's pinking in Fortnite. Yeah, it's over. American Godzilla doesn't really stand for anything. Even in the 2014 film, the human characters are just a guy we follow around and his family. The United States military is skeptical at first of Godzilla's involvement, but then they just accept that he is the only hero capable of stopping the Mutos and all is fine. There's no discussion or nuance about anything in the world. The Mutos that were awakened are instantly vilified without any nuance either. These things were forced to wake up and all they wanted to do was produce and have kids, but their children were blown up by Quicksilver, then the parents were murdered by Godzilla and everyone still claps in the end, even though everything's still in shambles and a shitload of people died. This is drastically different from the 1954 version where Godzilla is treated as a victim even after he terrorizes and kills a bunch of innocent Japanese people. And instead of clapping when the threat is gone, the audience is instead reminded that Godzilla never needed to happen in the first place and that because of bomb testing, he's now also robbed of life. American Godzilla being a Superman figure is really safe and boring and makes no sense due to the origins of the character. 2014 Godzilla isn't flawed because it has human characters and barely shows Godzilla with only a little bit of action fights. Because as we see later, those movies are even worse. 2014 is flawed because it doesn't stand for anything and is a safe depiction that makes this Americanized monster a hero without anything to say. And I know 1954 is old and that movie is aged, but recently a movie has come out that has blown all the Godzilla movies in the past 10 years out the water. And it was from Toho Studios where Godzilla is back in Japan and that movie was Takashi Yamazaki's Godzilla Minus One. Godzilla Minus One was why I made this entire video, because it might be the best Godzilla movie ever made, and it actually made me feel something. I'm a big box office pessimist, and lately American blockbusters have been safe, generic, and boring, which is no surprise that they've been flopping left and right because people are burnt out of high budget mediocrity. So to watch a Godzilla movie with compelling human characters, nuanced discussion with critiques on the Japanese government, while having havoc and consequences that feel impactful, while also having an antagonist that is menacing, threatening, and terrifying, all done with 15 million dollars was beyond satisfying. If it wasn't obvious from the games industry, with companies like From Software and Nintendo, Japan could cook up some pretty cool shit. Godzilla Minus One makes American Godzilla look like an embarrassment because it does everything better. Like 1954, Godzilla isn't a character, but more of a natural disaster. And for a natural disaster to have impact, first you need compelling people to be impacted. I cared about the human characters in this film, and I hated Godzilla for what he did to them. But the reason why the human characters were so impactful was because of Japan and how it's depicted. Japan is a place in history that has been through a lot of shit, which makes it a great setting for Godzilla because it goes hand to hand with its creation like we said earlier. After World War II, Japan was in a low state, and the victims of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as the firebomb victims, were innocent people caught in the crossfire between feuding militaries. The movie takes place right after World War II with Japan at its lowest point, which brings up a huge point for why this movie exists. It's once again an anti-war film where you're reminded that the Imperial Japan military was not great and that the modern Japanese government is not that great either. Japanese studios such as Ghibli and even films like 1954's Godzilla tend to only depict Japan as the victims to catastrophe from the United States. But something to remember is that after Japan's very flawed attack on Pearl Harbor, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto wrote this in his diary after Pearl Harbor. I fear all we have done is awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with terrible resolve. It makes sense why Japan is very anti-war after what the atomic bomb did to them, but old Japanese media has a massive trend of playing victim in history when, even before the atomic bombs, Japan's military was notorious for conquering other nations and being really brutal, committing tons of war crimes in their history. The Japanese military also had no value for human life. Brainwashing an entire nation that dying for said nation was one of the most honorable things you could do. It's why they had things like kamikaze pilots and seppuku. This is why Imperial Japan and American media is portrayed to be so relentless and brutal 
brutal, not caring if they lived or died. Because for the most part, they didn't care if they lived or died. It was expected that you were going to die in combat. Like I said earlier, with media like Oppenheimer and nuclear war being a really big issue today, the atomic bomb debate is now fresh again. But with everything aside, without the atomic bomb drop, Japan would have continued a relentless war with the United States. So while I know Godzilla 1954 is very much still an anti-war film about how nukes are bad showing what Japan went through, it does brush past that Japan's military threw a stone at the United States, killing United States civilians when they were well aware they were never going to win a conflict with the United States, but still did it anyway since they needed to get resources from claimed US lands that were under embargo laws. So Pearl Harbor was an attack on the US Navy to demoralize the US, but they didn't attack the repair yards, so it was pointless anyway and got their whole nation nuked in retaliation. So while the ethics of the atomic bomb can be debated, Japan's military put their civilians in harm's way for no reason, which is why modern day Japan is more resentful of Imperial Japan when it comes to anti-war rather than the United States. Japan during the 1910s to 1920s was in a really good innovative period called the Taisho Jedi. Japan was transitioning to more of a Western democratic government with a lot of Western influence impacting culture, arts, politics, and many other avenues. I need to clearly state that Japan and Japan's military are two different things. Japan's military was a parasite to the Japanese government taking control from the inside, which as we know was the demise of Japan itself. I joked about it earlier, but people like Ishiro Honda, who made the original Godzilla, was even at fault for this. While he acknowledged how horrific war was, he still made propaganda films for the Japanese military, which led to this cancer spreading. Propaganda and military control started dragging Japanese society into their conflicts. Men were expected to go to war and die. It was seen as honorable to serve and die for your military. This is why I prefer Minus One to the original 1954 movie, because Minus One is critical to the Japanese government. Godzilla in the film is going against the normal Japanese people. The government is no help and doesn't intervene, and neither does the US, because if they did, the film would be over in like two seconds. But Minus One is a critique to the Japanese government's beliefs and values in World War II. The main character is a kamikaze pilot that is full of survivor's guilt because he didn't fulfill the military standards of giving your own life for a government that doesn't really care about you. He is judged by his neighbors for not killing himself in war, and is hateful of himself struggling with survivor's guilt for also not killing himself in war. The film directly critiques Japan's old views of not valuing human life, or how Japan didn't care about anyone's life really at all. And while Godzilla is still an allegory for the nuclear bomb, the film really conveys how it was the everyday people who had to pick up the pieces and deal with the fallout. Godzilla Minus One is an unbiased masterclass when it comes to being an anti-war film, so much so that you could remove Godzilla from it and it would still be an amazing standalone film. Which brings us back to why America can't do Godzilla. Back in 1954 when Godzilla came to the US, it was censored and remarketed to look like a fun blockbuster, similar to something like The Beast of 20,000 Fathoms, cutting 20 minutes of crucial political discussion, where then after the main lead was an inserted American reporter, where then the critiques of America's nuclear testing and nuclear power were also censored and changed. 1956 Godzilla King of the Monsters is a spineless shit movie that gutted the original impact of the 1954 version and represents how the United States often views critical media. So when we look at the depth of something like Minus One and then go back to 2014, you see more cracks of how 2014 has nothing to say. My friend Sweets is online gave me a quote when we were talking about this video. If you want to know what the biggest piggy bank is in the world, look at the United States military. Funding games like Call of Duty, movies like Top Gun, and many other pieces of media to display the United States military. You could get a lot of your budget paid when you display the military as heroic badasses. But now you have restrictions of being a puppet, not able to bite the hand that feeds you. The United States propaganda is so prevalent that you might not even know it's propaganda. To film with American military technology and vehicles is expensive. Thus why the Department of Defense will give you money, tax breaks, and access to display the military in your film in hopes that people might want to enlist. But the catch is that the DOD has to approve your script and messaging of how the military is depicted. Thus we bring up Vietnam. The Vietnam War is heavily scrutinized in American history due to how badly they failed in that conflict and how it was overall pointless. So you have films that represent the brutality of the United States as well as the incompetence, like Apocalypse Now and Full Metal Jacket. And surprise, surprise, they got no funding from the piggy bank. Also, you know that movie Forrest Gump where Sheriff Woody was in Vietnam? Well, that segment was critical of Vietnam. So the script was changed by the Department of Defense because if they didn't, they'd also get no money from the piggy bank. When you do more research yourself, you see how much America cares about their image due to the films being seen nationwide. So they make sure that America looks cool and noble no matter what, even if the truth might not be so. So when you see Godzilla 2014 with a budget of $160 million with the American Navy and bomb squads and Air Force all helping Godzilla save the day, it's no surprise that the film had an agreement with the Department of Defense where they provided locations, vehicles, and military representation. And while at times the military is incompetent and kind of useless in the film, it's never acknowledged or critiqued with grand messaging. Because like I said, to bite the 
hand that feeds you is gonna drop your budget from 160 million to a low 15 million like Godzilla minus one. It's why Godzilla can't work in America. To be critical, the United States government requires you to be independent. And by how bloated the film industry is with high film budgets and how propaganda has affected how the Godzilla character is viewed, you make more money by having Godzilla be Superman, killing tons of innocent people where then they clap at him saving the day, rather than him destroying the United States with the government losing and being useless. And this has been a problem since 1956, when America turned a tragedy film to a blockbuster, gutting it of any meaning, and no surprise Godzilla King of the Monsters made way more money than Gojira. So much so that Japan stopped calling him Gojira and took on Godzilla, and repainted his image as the savior of Japan that fought giant monsters. 529 million, 387 million, they're making money, and that's all that matters now. But what is art, and how do we view art? Is a nothing blockbuster funded by the US military better than a $15 million Japanese film with a lot to say because it made more money? Is King of the Monsters better than Gojira since it made more money? We're beginning to look at box office as this risk reward system, where studios don't see the risk of making something if it can't possibly 10 times its original budget. If Barbie didn't make a billion, was it a waste of time? If Oppenheimer didn't almost make a billion, was that too a waste of time? And this rubs off how we view movies. If something makes a lot of money, it must be good. And if a movie flops, it must be bad. It's the same as judging a book by its cover. Yes, there's movies that spend way too much money not being creative because they believe they could 10 times their budget by simply existing. But then we get films like Gojira and Godzilla Minus One, which are real creative works of art that stand for something and matter aside from just money, and they need to be praised. But like how everything works, Godzilla isn't liked because of what it stands for, because what America saw was a cool giant monster that attacked Japan, not an allegory for nuclear war. And what they see now is a Superman figure that could sell toys. Godzilla has become a mascot to make money. It's why I can't enjoy the Looney Tunes version. It's why Godzilla can't work in America. But when it works in Japan, it works. And it works well. But if there's anything I can hope to get across in this video, it's to research the things you watch. And to give things with passion a try, even if you might not enjoy it. Some filmmakers actually give a shit about what they make. And use art to have a voice and tell stories without the dooming cloud of getting money from your pocket. Minus One is a must watch, but I fear like 1954, it won't be acknowledged or talked about in the masses, especially in America due to its subject matter and being a foreign film. 2014 Godzilla, you still look good and are shot very well and have the best roar, but you're nothing but a soulless nothing piece of propaganda that breaks my heart. Subscribe to the channel, like the video. I now got a Patreon by the way, where you could see how I edited this video in the future and can have your name pop up in the credits. Goodbye. I just got hit with a 50k tax bill, 300 racks in a year, how does that